Chapter 5 Love, Male and Female Love makes men lame and tame. The Kishwahili of East Africa. Love is not blind. It has four eyes. It has night vision. It sees well by day and night. Nigerian woman. Male pundits usually talk as if love had the same effect on women as on men. They seem to overlook the small fact that men and women are not identical, but complementary, and that the effects of a current on the opposite poles of a magnet may also be opposite. With a folly typical of those who imagine themselves as the norm, male pundits refuse to heed those few women who have told what love actually does to women, and they insist on projecting unto women what is true only of men. As a result, many famous sayings about love mislead by not indicating that they apply only to men. For example, according to Ambrose Bierce, Love is a temporary insanity curable by marriage. For the sake of accuracy, he should have qualified that by the opening phrase, in men. Similarly, when Francis Bacon remarked, it is impossible to love and be wise, he should have added the opening phrase, for a man. Likewise, the saying, love is blind, should be taken as shorthand for, a man in love is blind to his best interest. None of these remarks apply as to women. The woman in love is far from insane. She is anything but unwise or blind to her interest. On the contrary, her first sigh of love is like a whiff of smelling salts which clears her head, leaving her with four eyes and night vision. It instigates her to a ruthless pursuit of what she wants. That woman is indeed most rare for whom love is a beclouder, of the eyes, or a confuser of the head. Love acts on men and women in opposite ways. To see that, let us compare examples of a man in love and a woman in love. When he was hit by some woman's love harpoon, Willie Carter Spawn, nephew of the U.S. President, Jimmy Carter, put the following advert in the newspaper. To Susan Lynn, I love you so much that I would crawl through nine miles of broken glass and razor blades to sniff the truck tires that haul your drawers to the laundry. I would fist fight a gut shot polar bear with my hands tied behind my back for a few moments alone with you. I love you. Marry me. Willie Carter Span. A fellow's mind has to be unhinged to become a geyser of such foolishness. Hopefully, the marriage he was asking for would cure him of his madness. In contrast to the mush headedness of the love smitten man, Here's Barbara Streisand's portrait of a woman in love. In her hit song, Woman in Love, she declared, I'm a woman in love, and I'll do anything to get you into my world and hold you within. Is this not a portrait of a clear-headed huntress, resolute and resourceful? Was there ever a clear declaration of intent to hunt down and fetter and enslave? Is it any wonder that a man in his right mind would flee from a woman's love like freedom-loving Kunta Kinti from a slave catcher? To compare Willie Carter Spawn with Barbara Streisand is to realize that love is a disease of the heart, terrible for man's liberty, but an excellent pet pill for a woman hunting for a slave. When love smites a man, it turns him into a dazed prey. When it possesses a woman, she becomes a clear-eyed, calculating huntress, coolly stalking her fuddled prey. Not only does love act differently on a man and a woman, the word itself means quite different things to each. When a woman tells a man, I love you, she means, I want you to feed me, house me, clothe me, fuck me, get me great with your child, and take me as your burden until I catch a better slave. This utilitarian view is aptly expressed in the Moonlight Song by Nigerian maidens in which they describe their lovers as the axe with which I split wood then as the tree that bears money, then as the key with which I lock my door, then as the girdle with which I girdle my loins. In contrast, when a man tells a woman I love you, he means, I am eager to be your slave and ready to do everything I can to make you satisfied and happy. Which is why, when a woman hears a man say to her, I love you, her joy is great. For he understands him to mean that he has been knocked out, of her, uh, out by her chloroform of romance and she can safely tie him up with social ropes, 
tether him to her nest with legal chains, and while he is still sprawled out in love's delirium, begin to make a toiling jackass out of him. The Kishwahili poets are among the few male pundits who have gotten things right. They specify that it is men who are made lame and tame by love. As one of their songs puts it, love makes men lame and tame. Commenting on that song, Jan Knappert writes, In a few brief words, the song paints a vivid picture of what happens in the streets of Mombasa in the middle of the night. Painted girls wander about looking for their prey. Woe unto the man who is caught in their snares by their enticing looks and their luring words. Love covers him like a rash, like shivers of fever. If he is rich, he will ruin himself to please that cheeky little creature. If he is a man of power and influence, he will humble himself for her. They are in the open street to win her favors and receive little in return except impudent words. The men are like birds caught in a snare struggling in vain to free themselves. Given that, woman, uh, given that love makes a man lame and tame, is it any wonder that a woman fires the harpoon of love at a man when they meet in the cockpit of courtship? A visitor from Mars may be struck by the nonsense which a love-smitten man utters, by the eagerness with which an otherwise sensible woman listens to such nonsense. For instance, he will tell a woman that she is the most beautiful woman in the world, and she will give every appearance of believing him. All you need to do is look at the ugly duckling to know that she is no such thing. And then not even in her utmost vanity does she believe the deluded fool. Why then does she pretend to take his gibber seriously? Well, when he tells her with a shine in his eyes and a heat in his throat that she is the most beautiful woman in the world, she automatically translates him to mean that he considers her the most beautiful woman in his world. That he has been reduced to saying that shows her that he is sufficiently desperate with passion to become like putty in her manipulating fingers, and that for her is the vital aspect of the matter. Another nonsense which is often spouted by lovesmen and men and is eagerly awaited by man-hunting woman is a declaration of everlasting love. Everlasting? Now, now, nothing is more absurd than promising to feel love for anybody forever. No woman in her right mind, and bear in mind that women are quite down to earth, believes that a man could feel love for her forever, or even till death puts an end to his ability to feel love for anything or anybody. Women know the world is full of changes and that the emotion of love is one of the most ephemeral. So when a sensible, sensible woman craves a declaration of eternal love from a man and gives every impression of believing it, what really does she understand by it? A woman mentally translates this foolish man talk into reasonable talk and understands it to mean that in the overcharged state of his psyche, the fellow is ready to promise her anything, even things over which he could have no possible control. This is what makes the statement delicious and exciting to her ears. If he can promise an eternal feeling of love, it means he is ready to pledge himself to do something much more within his control, namely lifelong voluntary servitude to her. Now she can only get him to make the latter declaration in public before suitable witnesses her manhunt would be successfully concluded, where then the fellow will be publicly bound to husband, i.e. slave, for her for the rest of his days. However foolish it may sound, a man's declaration of eternal love works on him like an oath of loyalty. It psychologically binds him to carry out the obligation imposed on him by his love for her. After all, a man is taught to take his oaths rather seriously, especially vows made to his mother or mother surrogate. Assuming that his training by his mother is effective, he is not likely to abscond from his obligations to her surrogate, not even after the love he felt at the time of the declaration has long evaporated. When next we find a woman extracting love-struck nonsense from a man, we should not consider her absurd. No woman believes such nonsense literally. 
She knows perfectly well that they are lies and exaggerations, but they give her proof that he is sufficiently out of his mind to promise her anything, including what she really wants from him, lifelong nest slavery. Furthermore, feelings and oaths aside, we must not note that even what a man means by I love you, his I'll love you forever means I'll slave for you forever. And that is surely welcome music to a slave huntress's ears. A Martian observer might also be amazed that men appear blind to the predatory core of bridal love. As any clear-headed observer can see, between puberty and menopause, a woman is driven by her nesting instinct. For nest making, she needs the services of a hard-working provider and strong protector. This biological need gives the nest-making woman's love for a chosen man its predatory and exploitive core. It is this uninviting core that the mush of sentimental love is designed to conceal. But conceal from whom? Certainly not from the woman, but rather from her intended victim, who might otherwise flee for his dear liberty. Man in his sentimentality may refuse to acknowledge the love felt for him by the woman who loves him is, at its core, a slaver's love for a slave. Those who doubt that should uh, that should consider a woman's proverbial reaction to her spurned love, or to a mate who deserts her nest, when she cries, seduced and abandoned, her rage is that of a lioness who in its intended dinner has run away. When she cries that her husband has deserted her, her fury is that of a slaveholder whose slave has run away. If he has run off with another woman, her rage is as that the other woman is that of one slaveholder and another slaveholder who has kidnapped her property. Were men fully conscious of the predatory nature and exploitative purposes of a nesting woman's love for a man, they might be found each day praying, God save me from the love of woman. That men do not is a measure of how sentimentality thoroughly beclouds their eyes. That concludes chapter 5. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, donate, and share. Until next time, men, remember, love is the delusion that one woman differs from another. There are no unicorns.